Hi, this is Tim of the 1916 Company. Welcome and thanks for logging on. Everything you see here is for sale. We are waking up with watches. Reach out to me. I am still T Masso at thewatchbox.com for your questions about the price, condition, or accessory set of these watches. I can even supply additional photos. And it's crunch time. This is our Super Bowl. The holiday season is when we buy what we sell, we sell what we buy, and we are looking to build inventory. Trade us a watch for one that you'll be more likely to wear, or sell us a watch, sell us a an entire collection. We pay cash, we pay fast, we make it simple, we guide you through the process. It's a no-brainer. Reach out to Tmaso at thewatchbox.com to sell a watch with no upper limit on value paid. We will buy your whole collection. So let's jump straight in with a watch that's well known but rarely seen. Launched in 2013 at Basel World, this is the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Racing Dial. At least that's its official name. The unofficial name is the Tintin. As Waco and Robert Yen Brewer have established, this was actually supposed to be a Tintin branded watch. So it features the color scheme seen on the rocket ship prominent in the Tintin comics. And again, it is the spitting image of the machine, but for some reason, the licensing fell through. So the watch was made, but the branding didn't stick. So unofficially, the racing dial. But for Omega fans, you know that the racing dial from the late 60s and through the 70s, it's a very different look than this. So it does have that sort of staggered or checkered pattern. The color scheme and the blend, the proportion of the colors, it's the Tintin Rocket. Now, it's different on the dial side, but it's also a little bit different on the back, where you see that the lacquer declaring this thing flight certified by NASA and the first watch more worn on the moon. You can see it's actually red. It's not a black infill like it normally is. The watch is a standard moon watch in all other regards. You can see thermoplastic or Hesalite crystal just the way NASA likes it. 42 millimeter case, white varnished hands on a matte black anti-reflective dial. You can see the seconds hand of the chronograph is illumined. The watch has solid end links in the bracelet. And this is a modern Omega bracelet with removable links fixed by screws. Inside the case, caliber 1861, the Lamagna based moon watch caliber. Cam, lateral clutch chronograph, 3 hertz, 18 joules, manual wind, 48 hour power reserve. And what's intriguing here is that Wei and Robert Yan have established that somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 of these were made, which in the scope of Omega production is actually extraordinary, making this a very rare watch and sort of a collectible of the moment and perhaps one to really buy as a more sophisticated component of a keeper collection for the long term, because this is a watch that could actually gain some value. Very prominent in the community. This one is full box set and papers, the so-called Speedmaster Tintin. Now, speaking of Waco, he has a new venture called Grail Watch, and it follows up on several years of collaborations run through his Rake and Revolution magazines. So, of course, Rake is a fashion magazine, a style guide, whereas Revolution is very much watch focused. Well, the whole setup he's got now is that he's created a series of collaborations that have been Rake and Revolution inspired, but they often go under the title card Grail Watch. And so what we have here is the Angelus Chronodate 42.5 millimeters in titanium. This is a model that came out in 2020, and you could see that, or pardon, 2022. And you can see that the Revolution branding on the reverse side marks this as a limited edition of 25 pieces. And so the significance of this coming out in 2022 was that it was 80 years since the original Angelus Chronodate, which was the first broadly marketed chronograph caliber that included a calendar mechanism for wristwatch use. So this watch right here does have a calendar. It has a radial date with a quick set mechanism, which is a lot of fun to play with. You can see the dial is made of brass, but it is six and rose gold plated, so it is ultra red gold plated. There's plenty of luminescence. Uh, it's made by Angelus, which is sort of a boutique brand within a boutique brand. Angelus is the ultra boutique brand of La Joux Pere, which is actually owned by Citizen Group of Japan. But the Angelus watches and the La Joux Pere watches made out of La Chaux de Fonds, the heartland of Swiss watchmaking. You can see on my wrist, although it is a 42.5, it wears a little bit smaller than that. Part of that is down to the fact that it is a very light evacuate titanium and sapphire construction, but also the downward angling of the lugs themselves. A wonderful syringe style hour and minute hands. And when we flip that back over, we'll take a closer look. You can see that this is a distantly a value based movement, but it's been converted to a column wheel. And that's from the value's original cam system. And then it's also been 
equipped with an extended power reserve, which is now 60 hours. You can see there's a combination of sat nation, media blast, and polish here, which is quite accomplished and attractive. Taking a look at the winding bridge, you can also see that its bevel is broad and mirrored. It's a good looking setup. Angelus, well, figure that they're gonna make between 100 and 200 watches a year, and Le Jouperet's Arnold & Son brand is probably going to make between 700 and 1,000 a year. So again, like I said, rare and a boutique brand within a boutique brand. Now, Wei has broad-ranging tastes, and he works with many constructors. And so through the Grail Watch program, which you can see declared here, uh, he has formalized all of these collaborations into a series known as Grail Watch. And this is the Kodoka 2 from Stefan Kodoka. And it's basically everything you could ever want in a very simple, artisanally constructed, independent brand watch with a spectacular electric blue CVD that is chemical vapor deposition, a gaseous transfer process that's a little bit different from PVD. PVD is a line of sight mechanism, so you have to coat the surfaces from different angles, whereas CVD, which uses only a gas, coats complex surfaces and shapes evenly all the way around. You're familiar with seeing this type of coating, for example, on modern Chrono Swiss watches. Now, this is the Kodoka 2 Starry Night, inspired by the Vincent van Gogh painting of the same name. We have a spectacular undulating guilloche at center. We have Mobius strip style infinity hands. You can see the two of them right there. We have a hand engraved day night indicator up at the top of the dial. And it's, it's not a moon phase, it's a day night. You can see it moves in relatively speedy fashion. Stefan Kudoka cut his teeth as an engraver and skeletonizing specialist in watchmaking. Uh, he started his own brand in 2008 after working for many upscale labels. And for the first decade or so, a lot of his watches were wonderful but weird. It wasn't until the Kodoka 1 and then 2019's Kodoka 2 that he moved to more conservative designs that had a lot more appeal, and that's when his brand really took off. Now, what's cool here is the pervasive use of luminescent material, including on that hand-engraved day-night indicator up at the top. Very easy to miss if you're not looking for it. A spectacular thing to see by night. One of the best uses of lume I've ever encountered. This is a 39 millimeter grade 5 titanium 30 piece limited edition it's powered by Kodoka's proprietary caliber the caliber 1 which is based on the Habring A11 it shares very few parts with the A11 but it does share its basic drivetrain architecture with the Valshu 7750 albeit shorn of the chronograph and the automatic winding components which is why you can see that the train layout is just about the same uh, this is a fantastic watch because it does have high quality parts and because it's Valshu based it has some of the underlying refinements like a stop seconds function even though the watch, as you'll note, does not have a seconds hand. It's also got a relatively large size at 30 millimeters, another characteristic of the 7750 caliber. You can see double solarization here on the ratchet wheel, satination on the crown wheel core. There's a satinated and beveled click, which is gorgeous, along with a nameplate that's freehand engraved. Look carefully, and you can see not only is there a Mobius strip engraved into the balance cock, but if you look carefully inside the structure of the Mobius strip adjacent to the balance, you can see there's a little star acknowledging that this is the Starry Night Edition. A combination of glass, paste, and oil is used to create the satination or the frosting across the bridges. And then you can see, although there aren't a lot of edges to bridges, the ones that are there are beautifully beveled, and it's all got a power reserve of about 45 to 48 hours. About 46 is what's quoted. A really good looking piece and a 39 millimeters, very wearable. A way to get into independent watchmaking without wearing something that's too exotic meaning Erwerk, Richard Mille, or MBNF. This is a very conservative watch in size and proportions, but it's exuberant in its detail and its use of color and loom, and a really cool piece from Waco, again, a 30-piece limited edition. Now, Wei has a highly refined taste, but he also likes technology. As long as the machine has a heartbeat, remember Revolution Magazine's tagline is partly about love for the machine with a heartbeat. And that's exactly what we have here in this slimline manufacture monolithic uh, FPS for future past salmon from Frédéric Constant. This is a 
100 piece limited edition, 40 millimeters in diameter, designed after fine Swiss dress watches of the 40s and 50s. So we have these black polished Breguet style Arabic numerals. We have a combination of satination, of frosting, and polished Breguet style hands. But look at the smooth glide of that second sand. It's almost like the oscillator is beating at 288,000 vibrations per hour because it is. Debatun, Vauche Manufacture, and Zenith all tried and failed to make a monoblock oscillator successful. And it was Frédéric Constant, via their contacts, back in the homeland of Peter Stas, founder, that were able to make the silicon monolithic oscillator work properly. So Peter and Aletta Stas, the co-founders of Frédéric Constant, they are Dutch, and they actually went back to Holland and found companies specialized in horology and silicon that were able to work with them to make this incredible system function. Now, it replaces 26 individual parts. So among those, the escapement, the balance, the hairspring, all of that. This is a 9.8 millimeter silicon monoblock that is 0.3 millimeters thick. It's created with deep reactive ion etching and it combines ultra high frequency, so 40 hertz or 80 beats per second with ultra low amplitude, only six degrees. For comparison, typical mechanical watches, modern ones should run between about 290 and 310 degrees of amplitude. This is six. When you listen to it up close, it sounds almost like VFH uh, crackle, like, or VHF crackle, I should say, like very high frequency radios, like if you're in an airplane. Uh, the, the VHF crackle, sort of like, almost like you're listening to a Geiger counter, but it doesn't sound like any kind of conventional watch, and yet you could see it is still very much a mechanical escapement with the escape wheel at center and then the indexing horns adjacent on each side. A very special watch because it has such low amplitude, it can run at the super high frequency and still have an impressive 80 hour power reserve. And you can see it's automatic winding. A limited edition of 100 pieces with this incredible salmon dial with Breguet Arabic numerals. It wears really nicely, it's very comfortable. It's everyday durable and it's designed to be worn constantly. So you can see on my wrist because it has short lug-to-lug -lug dimensions. It wears beautifully and comfortably. A really special watch, and I actually debated making this the final watch on today's show because it is that special, and it was a narrow decision in the end, but I will say this watch from a technological standpoint is the most interesting that you are going to see today. Although from a weirdness standpoint, this one probably takes the cake. This came out in 2019, and it is a limited edition, 48.8 millimeters in steel, but a lugless case. This is the HYT Sunao, and it is a memento mori watch. So this is a genre of watch that's designed in macabre fashion to remind you that you will die, and time waits for no man. Well, the good news is it's more fun in that regard than a lot of such watches. You can see it has running seconds in one eye of the skull. The other is actually a color-changing power reserve indicator. The so-called, I guess you could call it the teeth, actually show the two be bellows that hold the immiscible liquids. One is clear, one is blue. The meniscus between them indicates the current hour. And this is a very slow timepiece. It gives you hours and seconds, but no minutes. And so you can see right there, the meniscus is at 12 and then it continues as it moves. The bellows are pumping, pushing and pulling. Now it's one, now it's 130, now it's two, and those fluids are in a borosilicate tube. The bellows are actually thin pieces of extensible foil that hold the fluids, and those are actually made inside of Philadelphia in the United States for HYT. Now you'll see, as the fluid reaches the end of its travel and we approach six, note that there's also a six on the other side, what will happen is it will reach the end of its travel and then rapidly retrograde. A cam pushes one bellows and that causes the other one to contract. And so the fluids jump right back to the beginning and they start their travel around. Now we have these pins that project out from the skull and then perforations that flank it. You could see that little perforations spell out the names of the hours. We have here a screw down crown. The watch uses what is fundamentally the HYT H101 movement designed by 
chronoed for HYT. It's got a manual 165 hour power reserve. And you can see, well, the watch is described as steel. It's really more like one third steel and two thirds sapphire, which helps to protect against scratches. And then on the back, you could see that this is one of five. It says so, a very limited edition. It's a conventional Swiss lever escapement here. So it is a watch with a regular mechanical heartbeat, a mainspring barrel, a drivetrain, and an escapement. And then the cams right here act on the bellows to cause the expansion and the contraction, and that's how the system works. It has a deploying clasp that is steel, just like the case. It actually has a very smart micro adjustment mechanism built in. So you could see how there's a little bit of indexed travel here, and you're able to micrometrically set that travel by pushing a little plunger in. And it's great because this allows you to fine tune the fit in case you are in between hole sizes. Now, the watch is big at 48.8, but don't be fooled. When this lugless H0 case came out in 2017, immediately HYTs went from being watches that only huge people could wear to watches that just about anyone could wear. You can see 48.8 is the diameter, but it's also the lug-to-lug -lug dimension, so it fits very nicely. A little bit macabre, sure. Uh, but then again, it's having a lot of fun with the notion that you will someday bite the big one. And maybe we all need to laugh at death a little bit more. You can see it also has exceptional luminescent qualities. Really something to behold in the dark. Panerai. Panerai, Panerai, Panerai. At its best, when it limits itself to two hands, three hands, or at most three hands and a date, as it is case shapes and dial simplicity, as well as legibility, that define this brand. And for 2021, the company debuted its E Steel, which you could see here in this PAM 1356, is a 58.4% recycled steel. So every little bit helps. This is the Smeraldo, the green emerald gradient dial. But instead of a conventional fume fade from the center out, we have a fade from the top down as though you are descending into the depths, lest we forget that Panerai watches were originally created for 1930s and 40s Italian amphibious combat cadre. So if you imagine the raid on Alexandria, the port in Egypt against the British fleet, that was the Decimo Flotilla, and that was Panerai. Not just watches, but also depth gauges and compasses for use underwater. Today, for the most part, they stick to watches, and the luminescence is spectacular. Here we have a Panerai sandwich dial, which is traditional. We have a stencil featuring cutouts of the numerals and the indices, and then underneath, we have a solid disk of luminescent material creating that spectacular effect. We do have the device protecting the crown, the iconic locking lever. This actually came about in the 1950s. It was conceived in the 40s, implemented in the 50s, and what we call the Luminor today is roughly equivalent to a 1950s Panerai 6152 combat watch, which would have had this crown guard structure. Now, it's easier than unscrewing a screw-down crown when your hands are wet, sweaty, or gloved. It also gives you more protection than a shouldered crown guard, because even if you hit it parallel to the stem, you're not going to damage the crown. You can see there's a little runner bearing inside the cam lobe that's been around since 2007 to make it smoother, and it's super iconic as a design. Cover it up, you still know what brand and what model. Plus, you can see on the reverse side, we have uh, the upscale Panerai quick release lug system with the little pusher release, and then you can push the bar through that retains the strap for quick and easy strap swapping. 300 meter water resistance, manufacturer caliber, 9010, free sprung, full balance bridge for shock resistance. It is a 72 hour power reserve with twin barrels, so it's got a nice long three day power reserve. A watch that wears large, but not comically large. It's comfortable. Even on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, you can see that you really measure this one by the edges of the case. And although the lugs do overhang the edge of my wrist, you can see that the case on both sides is well inboard. So I could recommend this watch for a wrist my size. If you like the look, and boy does it match my sleeve today, this is a fantastic companion. I should also show you that it has a fun set of setting mechanisms. One, of course, is the usual hacking seconds. But here's the thing. 
we also have a time zone function. So you can move that hour hand independently, even jumping the date forward and backwards if you were traveling across the international date line east or west. And note it's still ticking as I do this. So this is a very handy travel time function. This is the Luminor Marina Smeraldo. PAM 1356, a really cool piece. And again, E-Steel, feel good about recycling, right? Okay. In 2014, Denis Flageolet, the watchmaking genius behind Debetun, launched this, the DB28 Digital. Now, it takes the DB28 architecture that won the GPHG Aiguidor back in 2011, so a manual wind twin barrel movement, moon phase, and spring-loaded variable geometry ergonomic floating lugs. Now, it combines it with a dial that is a little bit unconventional by DB28 standards because it's a solid dial. Debatoon makes its dials, its movements, and its cases. So all this, including the guilloche of the dial itself, is in-house. This is designed to reference vintage pocket watches like the Paul Webers, jump hours built by Breguet for wristwatches during the 20th century. There are a lot of horological inspirations for this watch, and Denis Flachelet is always looking to the distant past when he creates a watch. We've got a lot to love here. As you can see at center, a moon phase that need be touched only once every 122 years, but this is a patented spherical moon phase. One half blued steel, one half white palladium. It's surrounded by fired blue titanium, and that also surrounds the minute track. Now, the stars are actually little cabochon of white gold that are inserted into the dial. And then we have a jump hour and scrolling minutes. So this is artisanal guilloche, fired titanium, we have a moon phase display that is spectacular in its operation. And you can see that it does have a quick set. So if you want to set the mechanism and watch it in motion, it's very easy to do and a lot of fun to play with. And then we have the jump hour system itself. So you can see the jump hour popping with alacrity when 60 passes the index. A lot of fun to play with and a lot of fun to follow. On the reverse side, the movement, manual wind, five days of power reserve in spite of the power intensive complication. Now you can see a lot of unique elements, including Cote de Betun, which are mirrored from side to side. So you can see the dark side of each stripe is facing outboard on each side. Normally it would be one side all the way across, but outboard here, outboard here, and that's because the wheel that creates the stripes is reversed to create the two sides. There's solarization on the barrels. They are self-adjusting. This is patented, so you cannot accidentally overwind them. You can see there's a blued brace at center that acts as a mounting point for the shock protection springs on the edge. So we have one, two, three shock protection springs. That's called triple parachute. It's there for promoting durability and shock resistance against damage, yes, but also to more rapidly recenter the balance staff pivot in its jewel cup to resume best timekeeping. Now you can see that the bridge has been fully rounded, mirror polished, and fired blue. Debatoon gives you traditional fine finish. It's not just avant-garde design. Look, for example, at how broad the anglage is on the edge of the double stacked barrel bridge. And you could see that we have a patented balance wheel with a white gold rim, a silicon wheel, minimal susceptibility to drift due to temperature changes, no real losses due to aerodynamic drag because it retracts the mass from the free airstream. And then as much of the mass as possible is put in the rim, which is ideal for timekeeping. You can barely tell it's operating. You can just see that the hairspring is breathing. The hairspring is two pieces shaped by hand and clamped together. This is also patented, giving you the shock resistance of a flat hairspring, the thinness of a flat hairspring, but the concentric breathing qualities of an overcoil. And again, the finish here is world class, as is the technology. This watch protected by no fewer than half a dozen individual patents. It is about 13 millimeters thick in grade 5 titanium, 45 millimeters in diameter. You can see it wears quite easily and comfortably. And if you have a wrist that's big enough for it, it might even fit underneath some cuffs. Certainly jacket cuffs will not be a problem. A watch that I could wear, and because of that, most small wrists will find quite agreeable. Very light on the wrist. We have a large custom a Debatoon factory strap here, saddle on the bottom, textile on the top, and a Debatoon buckles always match the lug design, which is a nice piece of design parallelism. I, however, have an eternal watch crush on the original 
1998 yellow gold Patek Philippe 5070J. Now, I don't like yellow gold. I don't like it at all. It feels antiquated. It feels frumpy. It's a little bit too visible for my tastes, a bit too Miami, and I am New York through and through. But there's something about the original 1998 to 2001 5070J, made in about 250 copies per year, first in yellow gold, then in white, then in rose, and then briefly for one model year in platinum. It is super scarce in every version. And the first thing I do when we get one is I look at how well-defined the step of the lug is. And you can see here, each facet razor sharp. Look at the edge of the bezel. That's the next thing I look at. It has a pagoda-like set of tiers designed to disguise the disparity between movement diameter and the 42 millimeter case size. And each one of these tiers remains super sharp all the way around. Now, though it's 42 millimeters in diameter and was considered monstrous by the standards of Basel World 1998 when it debuted, it's based on the 2512 vintage reference from the Patek Museum that was 46 millimeters. So this is actually the midsize. The dial, matte black, yellow gold hands, yellow gold numerals, a wonderful gilt style printing. Note the use of concentric scales, a seconds track, but then inboard of that, a tachymeter. Again, to disguise the disparity between the size of the case and the Lamagna based 2770 movement inside. Now, this is a Lamagna based on a very minimal level as Patek Philippe changes everything. Geneva seal finish. Power reserve goes from 48 to 60 hours. Flat hairspring becomes an overcoil hairspring. Unadjusted becomes six position adjusted. Mobile stud index becomes a gyromax style free sprung architecture. And then the finishing across every surface state of the art and world class. A capped Geneva style column wheel. A gorgeous manually adjustable lateral clutch. Look at that tiny eccentric micrometric regulator, that eccentric screw used to fine tune the methane, uh, meshing, I should say, of the driving wheel, the intermediate wheel, and the chronograph center wheel. And if you look carefully, I don't know how well you can see this, but we have one, two, three different teeth patterns here. One, two, three different tooth patterns, I should say. A wonderful interior angle on the chronograph bridge that is to die for. And then you could see the bevels on the edge of the steel parts as well as the edge of the brass components. This is world-class finish, proving that Langa has a different idea about finishing. But contrary to popular belief on forums, Patek Philippe finish actually doesn't fall short. It is just a very different Genevois type of style and sensibility frosty and cool to the warmth of the Langa. And this watch is equal measures fire and ice. The warmth, no, the heat of yellow gold and a black dial and that cool hand-finished Geneva seal manual wind chronograph caliber beaten away at a lazy five beats per second or 18,000 vibrations per hour. The only yellow gold watch that I truly covet and possibly the best example I've ever seen of this reference. If you love it as much as I do or you like the other watches presented in today's show, reach out to me. I am tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.